The caution makes demand. Ambidexterity, polyrhythm, a firm foot on the pedal. Ambidexterity, how oh, I say that? Persistence, <coughs> sounds like older quality for an architect. 12 years of that, and an explosion into 3D. Projects at once rhythmic and sardonic, right angles and twisted, chic, boisterous, and frankly, sometimes pretty fun. Like an album. Not surprising because Michel Roshkin, our speaker tonight, paid his dues on the bandstand, not on the drawing board, and got a grip on his unique repertoire on the tour, playing catch up with an architectural career, while still performing in La Vente Normale, whose breakup 12 years later allowed him to devote his energy full time to architecture. Looking at his work, you can see it's full of the hooks that in the music business make a song indelible. And it's full of the brash emotion and imagery that makes songs and buildings hit the chart. He's been through a number of incarnations since launching his first firm, Andrea Boyd Roshkin, searching one imagines for the outer limit of craft and possibility searching one hopes for the unique combination of function and playful geometry that animates his work. In 2004, he co-founded MXFD, which worked collaboratively with Mexico Ford University to study the expanding Mex city of Mexico and to initiate urban development project in unexploited part of that urban landscape. So tonight we're going to see and hear what he's been up to. I'm sure it will be a surprise, since there's no telling which of those many paths he's following. One thing that Michel would argue is that he's not monothematic. So without further introduction, I give you Michel Roshkin. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure being here. And, uh, not only uh, to talk a little bit about our work, but seeing really, really close friends and, and just thinking of all the experiences that we've been through. You know, it's hard to uh, just focus on the architectural part, but uh, thanks. And, uh, and uh, there's this uh, thing that I wanted to talk about. And it, it's contagious risk. And it's, it's funny because I, I, I wanted to, obviously I started writing in Spanish and contagious in, in Spanish is a verb, contagiar, and you can say, me contagiaron, contagié, but in English you can't say you contagiated somebody, you would have to say you affected somebody, which is not the same, because I'm, I want to talk about contact, no? And so uh, I want to start about this idea, if I say contagious, I hope you get the right idea, I don't want to say affected, but uh, if not, We'll go over it again. <laughs> so uh, I want to talk about contact. I want to talk about fear because uh, we, have, we have always feared contact in a way, uh, being infected by another person or what we don't know, uh, what we resolved uh, a bit of a threat to us. Uh, but especially in the last century and a half, I think there's this, this uh, a certain uh, puritanism disguised as, as hygiene, you know, that controls a little bit of what's around. But uh, but I've been thinking about this a lot, and, uh, and I don't want to be like this character who, who's afraid of doing things. And this is uh, not only uh, seeing it from the architectural part, but seeing it from uh, coming from di different disciplines as a, as a musician. And I studied film in New York for, for a while also, and, and try to put enough information in my head to, to keep everything moving forward. No? I didn't want to be this character of, obviously, that. I didn't want to be a woman in the latex suit, but uh, no, but I, 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 this I wanted to represent that 
I don't want to be all covered up and just feeling safe that uh, you're going the right way, and especially coming from Mexico where it's unavoidable to be contagious you know, or be uh, infected, if you will, of all the circumstances, especially with the outburst of the H1N1. It was kind of crazy not to think that, that uh, uh, I mean, everywhere you went as a Mexican, was like, oh, you're Mexican, don't touch me now. You guys have a swine flu. <laughs> And, um, and also, I mean, even in Mexico, you started having these images, no? I mean, we're, we're a society that you're always touching each other, you, you kiss, you hug, and, and suddenly with your friends, you're like, hi, how are you? And it felt really strange being that way. And I started really uh, becoming conscious about this idea about, uh, about uh, as a Mexican, and, and, and the thing about contagion uh, or being exposed to things, and uh, I can want to live any other place. You know, Mexico to me is the perfect playground because it's so chaotic, it's so, it, nothing works as it should. You know? It's so complex that, I mean, you walk out, you put your foot in the, uh, in the, in the street, you're almost run over by a, a taxi or a pesero as we call it in Mexico. So it's a place where you're constantly challenged to think so many things. You know? How can you improve infrastructure, so the public realm, uh, the buildings, uh, the, the parks, a lot of things. And, and uh, and this is, I mean, I, I talk to friends that live in Switzerland, and I say, wow, well, what do you think all day? You know, I mean, everything works really well, everything is perfect. You bring the permits in, they tell you this amount of time it'll take, and it takes that time, and then you build stuff, and, and in Mexico, that never happens. So you're, you're always guessing or, or trying to figure out how to move around, you know? And um, I think this also it, it has to do a little bit with, with the background. You know, I come from a... Um, my father is a, is a scientist, he won National Science Prize uh, in Mexico City, he, he studies liver disease, he now lives in Washington. My mother went to look for her guru in India, so this kind of also a contagious combination of uh, uh, spirituality with, with really uh, uh, intense uh, father who's still studying, who's still uh, doing private research. And also this idea between professions, you no? Know, when I was studying this, please don't laugh, no, this, is a, <laughs> this was me and the band, and, uh, and I was doing the architecture and music, and music at the same time, I didn't want to give up either one, and it was, again, it's just, uh, in a society like Mexico, at least uh, when I was growing up, they told you, you can't do two things, no? limit yourself to one, you can only be good at one thing, so focus on one thing in your life, and I didn't believe that, and I have never believed that, no? I think that the more information I start putting inside my head, or, or sometimes I even try to describe it as, um, as, as a tourist with a backpack and you're putting stuff inside your, your bag and when the right time comes in you can actually bring the stuff out that you recollected during, during your lifetime. And not only because I was a musician and I, I, I relate to this in, in every part of my lifetime no? or, or everything that I have lived in. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the past where, when I teamed up with Isaac Roy and uh, Miquel Adia, two uh, architects that um, Isaac belongs to this generation with Enrique Norte and with Alberto Kadach. And, um, and Miquel has Arquina magazine, he's a critic. And it was interesting because I also wanted to have this exposure or this contamination of, of a, a different generation of architects. And uh, so when we teamed up, uh, we started working on projects. The, the F2 house, we did projects for the government. And we did, a, we even tried this. It was our first shot at uh, real estate development. We asked some money for some friends, family, and we bought a piece of property. We said, well, let, let's try to do it. Let's try to do something that uh, we, we, we feel proud about. And we created this incredible uh, public space that didn't belong to any unit, so you can sell it because we're against all these neurotic uh, square meters that you have to sell even if you're working for developers. And uh, it was a wreck. We, I mean, we, we, didn't, uh, we were no good at it, so we actually came back and we said, let's, let's stick to designing. But anyway, I think the, the good part about it is that we at first, we didn't want to uh, be tagged with any specific field of architecture. And I think this also comes from my musical background, where when I was a musician, they would ask, what, what style of music do you play? And I said, well, what do you care about what style? I mean, I, I play music, and just listen to it and, and see what you think. And um, I, I saw some friends in architecture that they would specialize in houses, and then they wanted to do something else, but they were, they were just stuck doing houses because nobody else would call them to do anything else. No, it was just... It would be really uh, specialized in some field. And this is also something that I really wanted to avoid because I love designing and I don't care the scale of the, uh, of the building or the, or the commission. I, I just want something that is, uh, to me, design challenging. You know? So 
Uh, this is also a first signal of, 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 of caution, or this idea of the comfort zone. In, uh, because they were older architects and me, it, it was really comfortable when the project came in, they already knew how to handle it. And, and don't get me wrong, they're great architects, but uh, they, they started step one exactly the same every time we had a project. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to experiment, but I didn't want to bring them along on the ride and then feel guilty about uh, pushing them to a place where they didn't want to uh, work. Uh, so uh, I used this image, the, the boy in the plastic bubble, if you remember the, the movie. And uh, I, I, I didn't want to be in this plastic bubble just uh, looking uh, towards my, my window. So uh, when I broke up with Isaac and Mikel, I, I went on my own. And the, the important thing is that I didn't go on my own to, uh, to be independent and isolated and just uh, figure my things out. I, I went on my own to, to keep on uh, 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 researching, collaborating with a lot of people and try to get more information in my head. And, and this is a good example because then this is one of our last projects that we did. This is Bjarke Ingels. And I invited Bjarke, who's a good friend, to collaborate on a project. And, um, and uh, we collaborated on the Tamayo, which I'll, uh, I'll start explaining, and, and then I'll jump back uh, past and, and, and present. But uh, um, the Tamayo project was an interesting thing. It was a competition that we, there were seven firms selected for the project, and uh, Mexican firms. And by that time, Bjarke had been uh, down to Mexico to give a lecture, so uh, they gave us two weeks to submit the competition. So, uh, he was there for one week, so I said, okay, one week here, so we can collaborate, then you go back and we keep on working for the next week. Um, and this is the site in Atizapan, uh, uh, close to uh, Presa Marín. And uh, the important thing is that because when he went back and he's living in Denmark, we could collaborate uh, over Skype. And this is also uh, what I always get into discussions about people uh, not uh, talking about uh, globalization and we have to be really local and I say, well, what's the problem? I mean, I, 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 I don't think there's, I mean, here we're Skyping 24 hours, uh, we're working on a project 24 hours a day. Uh, when they went to sleep, they would send the information, we would work again. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm totally in favor of, uh, of technology and of, of being able to work with somebody and trying to explain the, the important things of being in Mexico and doing this Tamayo Museum for Mexico. And with this, you'll understand a little bit better the project. These were the drawings given to us by the client. The client was really neurotic, and he gave us a binder about 800 pages. You know? So uh, even, if you see that one over there, he even drew, drew the furniture. You know? so that, which client gives you the furniture drawn on a, on a floor plan you know, for a competition? So uh, we grabbed the, the, the program, and we split it up, and we started to do, doing different options. And we said, what happens if we do a vertical um, a museum, or what happens if we maybe uh, try to slow it on the side. And there was all these contradictions because they wanted a, a flat building functional-wise, functional, uh, functional wise, but uh, they also wanted something iconic. So uh, after giving it a couple of shots, this uh, uh, circular uh, version of it with an internal patio, and even joking, I remember uh, stepping with, with Bjarke and telling him, what happens if we just cut this piece out and just put it underneath the building so it can't deliver and um, we said, well, that would eventually look good, no? This way we combine the optimal functionality of the building, but we give them uh, optimal iconicity. So um, we did exactly what they had given us in the drawings at the beginning. And uh, we tried to talk about this white cube opening, or, or better yet, this private uh, uh, museum that could open up its storage space to have um, a place to actually uh, be visited by the, by, uh, by the client, uh, by, the, by the, the people going. Uh, to visit the museum, and not only this, this is something that I'm fascinated with. That uh, uh, not only seeing the art collection, because nobody know, no, nobody understands really what happens when the trucks come in, the, the crates come down, they open the crates, they catalog, they photograph. I think this is a magnificent process of seeing the how everything works uh, in the museum or in preparation for for an exhibition. Um, so these are the diagrams when we put the cross on the site, and and obviously imagine a little bit of uh, thinking of Mexico where religion is an is a big deal, no? And uh, so we had this project with a cross, and we thought uh, obviously they were gonna uh, kick us out of the competition, no? And uh, and um, we ended up winning the competition. Uh, and I go a little bit faster so I can show you some of the other projects. But what's interesting is that we created, we tried to, even though it's storage space, we tried to create a second skin. So you have these circulations going around the building, um, and then uh, you have the main exhibition area, which is cantilevered. Uh, uh, 
It's 90 meter cantilevers on both sides, and some diagrams of the ramps going down. You have the elevator, you have um, uh, the basic circulation. The yellow line represents the, the other the circulation space with the cantilever cross, where you're actually seeing the view of Atizapan and, and, uh, and Casa Marin. And we were playing with the, with the company uh, in Mexico called Santa Julia, and they do black place brick. And uh, we were trying to do a facade of place brick that actually, on the exterior, it's not, it's not closed. So you actually, the wind is coming in, you have these incredible views. We, uh, we're producing six different pieces uh, to create a complete skin and the envelope of the building. Um, this is an exaggerated uh, diagram, so you can see the different, uh, the different uh, sides of the, um, of the bricks and uh, structure how it, structurally how we would uh, get it to work. And then uh, some views from the interior spaces, playing around in the backyard of the, of the office. And uh, um, as I was explaining, on the inside, uh, all the structure is, is, is in between two pieces of glass. So you have the right temperature, you have the right lighting, you have everything, all the conditions for a, for a museum and a storage space. But on the outside, you have this incredible um, um, a sequence of, of walking with the, with the temperature that we have in Mexico. That, uh, it, it, I mean, it's getting extreme as it's in every other part, but not, not, not as extreme to close it up. So the clients also like this. Uh, these are some of the views in the exaggerated version where we would take all the provisions out, but actually you can close it. You would have curtains on the inside. You, from the storage space, you could actually see towards the exhibition space, people going down the ramps. Mm. And then, um, some of the different formats of art on the inside of the space, north light coming in. I won't go through all the details. These are some of the images of how it would sit on the side cantilever. And obviously, you want uh, we wanted to create these shading spaces, uh, shaded spaces underneath uh, the, the roof terrace, which is also uh, taking advantage for exhibition areas. Um, and a little bit of how 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 this works. And and uh, obviously, after after this. Um, uh, well, I'll tell you a little bit of the story. The, the project is a little bit on hold because this, the, the site that they have donated for this project to be able to be built there, and as sometimes happens in, in Mexico, was given by one political party, the other political party won, so now they don't want to give the site. So it's this political thing that uh, we always, uh, us architects, end up getting involved in. And we only want to do the project, no? but uh, we end up, end up trying to convince now the other political party to do it. But, well, another important point in, in, in my office, in my practice, and I'm going back in time now again, uh, the first project that I did coming out of, of Isaac uh, Roy and Miquel Adria's office is um, the, 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 the PR34 house, and it was a house for a, a ballet dancer. And the important thing uh, that I learned here is that understanding the part of the needs and the desires uh, uh, of, of the client. And, and uh, I understood at this point that, that programmatically, I mean, the house can change, and it can change uh, maybe a bigger room, maybe get a bigger kitchen, maybe a bigger uh, social space, whatever. But it doesn't ever change that much. And uh, you look at the different programs of buildings; it, they don't. Uh, also, the change is not that drastic. But what changes dramatically is who you're working for. So I think it's the first time that I sat down and I really started doing research on who am I sitting down with, what does my client want, what what are her needs and what are her desires. You know, because of course she needs a bathroom, she needs a kitchen. But this was a 19-year-old ballerina dancer, you know, and. Uh, it's a, it's a funny story because uh, and my client, uh, he refurbished the complete house. We, we helped him refurbish the house, but he wanted her daughter uh, to be independent, so he wanted to build an apartment on top of his house, no? which is not really independent at all. No? <laughs> it, was, it was kind of perverse. No? I, I, I was just expecting my client to say, put some cameras inside so I can watch her all day. Uh, but anyway, I think today we were excited to do a, a contrast of the existing house, which is a 1968 house with this new, uh, well, new at the time we finished this, and uh, this date is wrong, but it's I think 2002 when we finished the house. It's a very, uh, you see the floor plan, it actually works in a very simple manner, we're breaking down the program in public and private, but what was interesting, as I was explaining, is this idea, of, uh, she was explaining to me about ballet and dance and what dance uh, uh, meant to her, and, uh, got a scholarship to go to Russia. So a very passionate uh, uh, girl. In a, and we wanted to do like two bodies in motion. And actually, I mean, that's the poetic part. And we actually uh, did two bodies because there was existing main quarters up there. So we had to break the volume in two. 
so it ended up having two volumes uh, uh, because we wanted to take advantage of the structure, but it also it worked in, in the metaphor of, of what we were trying to do. And um, it, also some things that I love to talk about and understand. At the beginning, I think when I was studying architecture, I, I complained a lot about living in Mexico. You know, at the beginning, I said, oh, we're not very fortunate, no, third world country, we're down there, and we don't get to print, uh, have our uh, 3D models and give it to a company and have them produce a 3D building. And uh, we need to explain to the workers what we want to do. And over time, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad we have this, these type of workers in Mexico that uh, you can sit down with them and, 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 and try to guide them in an experience where I always talk about uh, from digital design to local fabrication. And it doesn't apply only to Mexico City, but uh, if you want to be architects that are working in different parts of the world, you have to understand what are the benefits of working in a different country. I mean, what, what do they have that we don't have? How do they work? Uh, in the case of working, uh, if, is it, are there bigger companies? Is the, is the labor uh, there better in some way? So for instance, in this project, um, uh, we were doing this um, uh, metal coated, uh, it, it's metal sheets uh, uh, that come, that weld together with the structure. And then if you, obviously you have the expansion joints on the inside of the project. I won't get into all the details, but when we were uh, kind of working all the, the, the body of the, of the building, the metal workers that were there, they were not doing the, the job that I wanted. So I remember this place in Mexico, in Colonia de Torres, where uh, if you wreck your car when you're a kid or you're the first time you use your father's car, you take it there, and, and in about half an hour, you have these body shop workers that, I mean, they do an amazing job while you have some tacos in the corner. And, uh, and I said, what if I call these guys? You know? What if I uh, contage or, or, or contaminate the, my project, bringing in guys that don't know don't have to do anything with architecture or construction and bring them in and try to work this job. And I, I brought them in the site, they started working on the project, and the surprise is that we, we I got the job cheaper. Uh, I had a great time because I was explaining to everybody what we wanted to do, and um, obviously everybody looked at me like I was crazy and didn't understand why these guys were working there, and, and, um, but I think the result, uh, we were really happy. Well, uh, all these uh, custom-made uh, elements that we can work in stainless steel also, there, there's things that are fascinating to do in Mexico because we get them uh, obviously very, uh, or much cheaper than in, a, in any other place. Um, I'll go a little bit on, on, on with this project. This is, this is how the house sits on top of the existing one. We did work on the one below. Uh, we cleaned it up. It had all, obviously these dark glasses with gold and mullions and everything. So we kind of cleaned up the house. We left the father living in the 1968 house and then the contrast with his 19-year-old daughter in the, in the upper house. Um, and uh, with this, I'm, I'm going to jump to another project which I, I'd like to talk about also uh, of, of things that happen sometimes when, when and you don't expect them to, but it's... Uh, I, lo I love, like to let things happen, no? I don't, I'm not uh, close to... Uh, and, and I'll explain, no? but uh, yeah, this is Falcon headquarters, which is a corporate building that we did. I'll go really quick. It's, it, it, it's, it's a building that we did a couple of years ago, 2004, and, uh, and uh, it's a, a corporate building. It's a, it's a place where you have houses in, in general, but the houses, the, the coding, the, the zoning changed, and then the houses got converted into office space, but they never changed the, the, the type of houses, so it, it looks like a house, but now it's an office space. And what we try to do in this one is convince the client to, to at least change the house that was inside of the, of, of the project. You know, when we got there, we would see the arches. And obviously, I mean, uh, and the client was really interested if we could do something interesting with the project. And we said, well, of course, we can try to do these uh, pixel ideas that also came from the original concept or the main uh, uh, slogan of the company. I mean, uh, uh, and, and we worked around this. but. Uh, uh, we wanted to create this garden that would benefit the people on the inside of the building. So the building would look good from the outside and would create an image for the company. But we uh, created an interior garden with this second skin that obviously um, uh, is for the people that are uh, working inside the building. Uh, we are really uh, happy with the results. Uh, we were using Panelite. It was, I think, the second project that Kristen uh, Mitman, a good friend from New York, uh, it, we were working on. It was still very experimental. and. Uh, I think they're doing great now with their materials, and um, we really achieved the, 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 a building that we, as I was saying, that we're happy because of the orange light coming in and the workers. Even though it's a great day, the orange quality of the of the core of this, this plastic core inside the door and brings in this uh, nice light. But uh, after a couple of years, we got a 
well, this was last year, we got a phone call by the guys from, from Porsche. And uh, they had seen the building and they called us and they said, do you mind if we go down to Mexico and we want to shoot the new campaign for our, our new Panamera car? No? I said, come on, I mean, this, I have new projects. You can maybe come see some new projects. But no, 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 this, this really is good to the campaign that we want to do. So again, this is some of the things that you might as an architect say, why? I, mean, I don't want to have these guys coming over. I don't want to bother my client. Well, of course, if you tell your client that you're going to have a Porsche campaign done in his building, he's going to be really excited about it. So uh, uh, I called him up. He was really, really excited. He went, obviously, he said, when are they coming? He brought in some friends. Unfortunately, obviously, they didn't bring the car. Everything was done CGI. No, it was <laughs> <a lot of laughs> so uh, uh, I was like, where is the car? I want to see it all. You know, what they're scanning everything around it. They're going to bring it in 3D. They're going to map all the information, which was an, an incredible experience. Te uh, technically, no, because I learned a lot about these new scan cameras and stuff, which I, I, I it, it reminded me a little bit of the time when I was a musician and we were doing music videos and you started learning about some other things that you're not uh, uh, closely involved. But, uh, but anyway, he loved the final results. He has these blown up pictures now in the uh, uh, main meeting room of the office. And uh, this is also another thing that I, that I was talking about, the, the, the contamination process, no? Um, and, and coming back to, the, to these images, uh, this is a part where I, I obviously learn more about the mistakes that we've made than the, than the things that we uh, know we did right, no? And uh, um, it's not only about risking, and I, and I say this uh, because we've, there's this trend now where everybody's working, uh, uh, we're breaking a little bit of the, what happened in the past about uh, Architects didn't collaborate that much, and now we feel really proud about collaborating a lot. So everybody's working with everybody, and we brag about this as a new generation, but maybe that's, I mean, it's good, no? But we also have to be very careful, and, and I'm going to explain a couple of projects uh, uh, in order for you to understand why, I mean, we have to be careful. This is, I don't know if you, you, you might be all aware of the Ordos project, no? A master plan done by Herzog and Demeron, and, uh, and they invited I Wei with the Chinese artist to, um, I helped them do the master plan, and, and they invited a hundred architects from different parts of the world, which at the beginning sounded great. So okay, again, it's do a 100 housing uh, community, which we're proud of. But uh, you're going to see the result. I mean, I, I mean, first of all, I mean, uh, I don't remember uh, the first time we got there. No, you see all these men in black, 100 guys just walking out of the buses, <laughs> going out in the desert. It looked like a sci-fi movie, no? It was, like, it was it, 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 I mean, it was crazy, and. Uh, and I remember uh, one of the first talks that we, uh, there was, there was an architect, I won't say the name, but somebody in the first meeting, imagine 100 people gathered in a room and saying, well, what do you think the master plan should be about? So then uh, an architect, uh, she lifted her hand, she said, well, I'm pretty concerned that we need to do a sustainable community and blah, blah, blah. She, and, said, and then some other guy lifted his hand and said, what do you think is sustainable about flying 100 architects from different parts of the world? We just blew a hole in the ozone layer just to get here. I mean, you want to do sustainability? Have them hire the local architects, no? And stay home. Uh, so this is the kind of topics that, that were uh, talked around, no? And uh, I can't tell you that we had a bad time. Of course, we had a, well, we had a good time, but it was, it was like Groundhog Day when we were like for one week in this place in Inner Mongolia. Um, with the same buffet every day, the same uh, music, and uh, I mean, obviously, Rocio, my wife, who's she's here, she almost threw herself out the window. A hundred egos talking about their most, their bigger projects and their most impressive uh, things that they were doing. But well, uh, I don't want to talk about my house in this project. I want to skip uh, the house, which I can maybe tell you uh, uh, some other time. But I want to get down to the images of the result of the of the site. Which, sorry, <laughs> this. This is, this is the, the result that we ended up having, and you start seeing a, something that to me is, is a true mistake, because it doesn't matter that you're bringing talented people to work. Somebody has to have clear guidelines and clear understanding of what things should be. So there's, I had in my head like this comparison of social housing, and then this, and say, well, the difference is only, well, <laughs> a lot of millions of dollars, no? But, uh, and, and on the other hand, and I really, I mean, we felt like the client was pimping us, because, uh, uh, he had a hundred architects there with our models, and he was walking around with his friends, saying, which house do you want to buy? I'll introduce you to the architect. So we were like, I mean, I felt really like, just waiting there, to, well, I won't say the word, but just waiting for somebody to, okay, come in with me to the room, you know? <laughs> and, uh, that's not a nice feeling as an architect, no? So, uh, uh, 
some of these houses are getting built, and uh, I, I, I don't feel, uh, as I was saying, proud of uh, being part of the project. I think it's a learning process, but I hope we really learn fast. Uh, because obviously, uh, some developers, and, and I also make fun of this, of the difference between the developers or the, uh, or the, the predators or predators, uh, and uh, they, they think it's a good idea to invite architects because they're gonna sell better, no? they're gonna get all these media attention. No? And, uh, and the second project we did, which uh, involves uh, two good friends that are sitting down here, and, and, and Tom, and we were invited by, by Yang Sung Ma and, 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 uh, to do this master plan in Guyan. And so uh, 10 firms, and obviously again, we were really excited to go inside China. We went, uh, saw the project, uh, there was, it was a raffle, no? We, we chose some papers to choose uh, to see who was getting each building, who was getting that, uh, who got to do a high rise, who got to do a low rise. Um, some experiments that I wanted to do. Um, and, well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this project. I wanted to do an office building uh, and, and, and really rethink the typology. So I was think, thinking a little bit of Irwin Howard on acid, no? And uh, and this idea that maybe in, in, in an office building, uh, they're all. The typologies are mainly made of glass. This we work with uh, Rob uh, Snooks and uh, Roland uh, from Kukui, and we were we're always ah sorry, is it that sound better? Sorry, were you hearing me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. And uh, so we were trying to do this like porous building, and if you go to uh, Kukui's website, they, they advance a little bit more on this idea of the porous building. But it's, uh, we were working on this structure, and I think it's the first time. Well, not the first time, but. Uh, uh, I remember that instead of having a client uh, criticizing and telling you that he doesn't like your design, I had Ma saying that he didn't like the design. And he said, no, you know what, you have this building that you did in Dubai for a competition that I really like. And I said, yeah, Ma, but that was for Dubai and it was a different building. No, 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 but I really want this to be here. So I remember that ironically somebody in the office said, well, it's in China, no? So uh, if there's this culture, uh, a little bit of the culture about copying things and now they're improving what they copied at the beginning, why don't you do a better version of the building that you did originally and copy it in a better way? So uh, we presented uh, this building, which was obviously a, we try to do a better version of it, but uh, anyway, it was an, an office building that we presented. We were all excited to get this commission in, in China. We thought we were gonna go ahead with it. Uh, we worked a lot of the detailing. I mean, we finished. Uh, we didn't get to do construction documents. No, we did, we, we did like a, um, uh, an advanced DD design for it. But uh, again, when we saw the final result, and this is the result, everything just collapsed. No, I mean, everybody started criticizing the project again about oh, all the architects they're not talking to each other. This is crazy. This is what's happening to the new master plans that we're seeing everywhere in this in, in new cities. And uh, and of course. Again, I mean, it's important to recognize when you make mistakes. No? And, uh, and, 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 and now that we're working on some other projects that, we, that are involved uh, or get master plans, uh, we're really rethinking of how to do things that, that really work in the right way. And it's not about, I mean, if we, are, we can be really creative, we can be really creative in a way that everything starts uh, working together in a, in, in a positive sense, not only uh, uh, things that might look like they're competing against each other. No? And, um, and for instance, I mean, uh, I also talk a little bit about about competitions, no? And 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 and, and um, I show this image because uh, this is my collarbone, which I broke when I was uh, uh, lecturing in in in, uh, in Austria, and uh, I fell down snowboarding, and I had an operation, and they put a nail, and it, I show these mistakes because it doesn't mean that I'm not going to do them again, no? I obviously I, I still want to snowboard again. I don't mind if I break another collarbone or a leg, but, uh, but it's about uh, uh, this idea of, of really uh, learning from what you have been doing, no? And, and I'm going to show uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, a competition that I did, um, and this is also a, a story which is, this is the second time we have been working with, with this client, and uh, the first time he had sort of uh, um, uh, tricked us in a way where he invited us to do a competition, but the site was not his. We didn't find out uh, after two years later, we were competing against uh, Hani Rashid. Uh, we lost up at that time. And, and uh, of course, I said I'm not working with this client ever again. He called again and he invited us to do a competition in Dubai. And I said, of course, I'm not working. And he deposited a really nice amount of money in, the, in, in our bank account. And obviously, at that time, we said, okay, we will work with you again. 
No, I mean, I, we try to set the conditions. We say we don't want competitions. You have to send us the papers that you want, the site, send us everything, so we know that if you're talking seriously about the project. Uh, he did at the beginning, and uh, he invited us to do this competition in Dubai. And um, I made a little bit, uh, uh, well, not a joke, but I was, uh, uh, one of the things that he wanted, and, and I remember him saying, uh, we don't know what the project will turn out to be, but we want to have EST. And I said, what's EST? He said, well, it has to be the biggest, or the shiniest, or the tallest, or whatever. And uh, I immediately thought of this, no? I mean, this is a Manhattan movie, and we were, we were talking about, I mean, uh, every time, I mean, uh, they're taller, every time, I mean, time, the, the time length is always shorter, no? Because of the, 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 their fame frame of the tallest building in the world now lasts like a couple of months, no? I don't know how long it's going to be until they announce a new building uh, that's going to be the Burj, uh, well, what's the new name of the Burj Al Arab, the, the Burj Dubai? Well, this new name, and, and I don't know, somebody knows that they already presented a new building higher than that, but anyway. Um, I said, what if, is this the only way to show power, no? Uh, what if we change orientation, or what if we shift things around, no? Does size really matter that much? And uh, what if we go back to the origin? And we presented this project, which is a hotel, and uh, it's called Code Horizon. And we, we said, um, let's try to do something that instead of being this uh, vertical, big, uh, architectural element, what happens if we start doing something that are introspective towards the inside? And, uh, and this is the site where uh, it's located, it's called Bawadi, and I think Rem won the gates for these two projects, and they want to replicate Las Vegas on the inside of the, uh, of the space. And again, um, sorry if I jump a little bit quick on the projects. Most of the times we, uh, we're a 20 people office, but we normally grow it to about 60 people because we invite, uh, again, talking about contamination or, or contagious risks, we invite landscape designers, sociologists, uh, financial advisors, uh, we build up teams about 60 people, and the, the incredible thing that has worked for us is that we try to customize each team for the, the, depending on each project. So even tackling, a, we had a park here, and we even designed the park to integrate to the building, which we, we were not asked to do. And, and again, here I was talking about we don't want to go vertical. We, uh, we were joking about the end of the Pina era, the, the penis era, and maybe talking about the vagina era towards it, a little bit more. Uh, towards the inside of an auto-protective building and uh, a building that can have the ability to shade and, and, and be uh, produce its, uh, its own needs. And, uh, and here, uh, uh, it was a 1,200-room hotel, and we didn't imagine uh, the, something really impersonal about being the guest 1,180. So uh, we broke up the building into different parts, and we said, what happens if uh, you're coming for business, so you have a business wing, and then you have a business uh, reception that you go to the business part. If you're coming with your kids, you have a hotel that's uh, specifically concentrated on people that are arriving there with the kids. And um, to make a long story short with this project, uh, when we were presenting the project, uh, we were at the hotel and the uh, lobby door, uh, the elevator door opens, and I see Bjarke Engels coming out of the elevator, no? and I ask him, what, what are you doing here? He says, oh, I got this commission by a client, that we're doing a hotel in Bawadi, and uh, so I started asking him, again we were competing, the client had paid uh, five different firms, told us that we had gotten the commission, and uh, he put us to compete against each other, no? I mean, it was um, uh, Philip Stark, uh, Jaime Hayon, uh, Bink, and, uh, and I don't remember the name of the other office, but again, we were, uh, it was really disappointing, no? I swear that this time we are not working with the same client ever again, no? <laughs> Uh, and uh, and uh, I'm also uh, I'll show you another quick competition that has to do with a little bit of um, uh, some of our concerns in Mexico. This has to do with the with the, the arch for the bicentennial. Uh, uh, our president Calderon had this brilliant idea of celebrating, commemorating 200 years of, uh, of the independence and 100 years of revolution in Mexico, which is now in 2010. And um, uh, he wanted to do an arch, which ironically, I mean. Obviously, we didn't agree with the idea that he spent a lot of money on doing a, something that didn't work for any specific reason, but just to have a, a, a symbol that commemorated. So the first thing that we asked is that we want to win or we don't want to win. I mean, because in Mexico, we're a society that cri critique is not very common. If you're criticized, it's kind of a bad thing, and you're, you feel bad because your friend criticized you. And, and uh, we, we don't get into these conversations. It actually nourishes you and make you better. So, and we thought it was good to do a small critique about the project. We decided we didn't want to win. I mean, there were 
Alberto Calach also uh, didn't, didn't agree with the competition. He didn't even present. He didn't uh, submit anything. We said, okay, I mean, let's let's submit something at least that we, we get something talk, talked about it. And, and, and because to us it would have been more interesting that the president would bring in 36 firms and talk about how they would they, uh, have their festivities or how they could celebrate this bicentennial. But anyway, um, we started mapping the most important parts of the project, which actually had to do with the pedestrian realm, and seeing how in Paso de la Reforma, which you have a new, well, not a new avenue, but you have Circuito Interior that, that cut out the main access to Chapultepec. So if you're walking in Chapultepec, in the part of the museums, as you, as you um, in this part, um, and you're walking down, that, down uh, to Reforma to go to the city center, there's a, a total disarticulation. You don't get uh, pedestrian rights, you get run over by uh, buses, there's no even, there's not even a sidewalk. So we started uh, mapping uh, first this, this thing, and these are the headers of each of the boards. We presented four boards, and the first board was no to the monument. We didn't agree on the monument, and we, again, we were talking about Stonehenge, and we were going through the pyramids, and we said, well, if today somebody did an arch, it would have to do something that it was a, it was a, programmatic, a programmatic element that would commemorate, but also would serve as a purpose you know, for something. Uh, public space was the other boards, and they were really intense about how it was going to pay, it be paid. And uh, ironically or sarcastically, we said, well, uh, you can have one day of Carlos Slim's salary that would pay for the complete building. Or you could have, um, um, the other one is uh, uh, four secretaries of state for 10 years. And the last one is like uh, 10 workers for 100 years of their lives working for the project. Uh, the other board was about a potential citizenship. and. And I mean, as here or in most other countries as well, the urban sprawl is affecting drastically the city. And, and we, uh, this is nothing new, but the idea of redensifying the centers and, and so people don't commute as much because you have people commuting for I don't know how many hours just to get to Mexico to work and go out. And, and the last word was this idea about really talking about confrontation, but not in a bad way. It's saying confrontation is not, is not bad no? if it makes you grow and if it makes you better. And, um, uh, we wanted to express something formally, so first we were talking about these ideas of the park connecting, and then once we, we made sure that we had the park figured out, and we even uh, gave Chapultepec, I don't, know, I don't remember how many more hectares, but we made it greener, you know, in, in case they, they wanted uh, to talk about sustainable issues, we said, we're giving you more park. Uh, but we decided to put social housing on top, on the best part of, of, uh, of Reforma. We said, what happens if uh, I know uh, a friend of mine said, was saying that it looked like a financial district and it, that maybe the government might, might go for it if it, uh, it was a new financial district. No, 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 let's keep it as, as social housing in the best part of the city. But even when we were doing the renderings, uh, uh, I wasn't too, too happy about it. I mean, I like uh, playing around with the idea, but I, if we were really wanted to do um, a, a critique, uh, I had invited a, a photographer friend who's an artist, and he uh, went and photographed all the Mexican riots and the graffitis and everything you see in the images, except for some Bansky's, which my friend loves, uh, is really what happens sometimes in the city. And it started being, or, or becoming uh, images that I, I really liked in a cinematograph, in a cinematograph, in a cinematographic way, you know? Uh, like uh, a little bit of 12 monkeys, you know, with the ideas of buildings burned a little bit and kind of this idea of saying be careful what you wish because you might get it, no? Or be careful about these competitions that you, you're talking about. But, but anyway, we, we, we had a good time. We, we were expecting, I was not expecting uh, a nice phone call from, from nobody in the government, but uh, I was expecting that maybe we could debate a little bit on, on the project. Um, and uh, what we got, it was, and at the end it was uh, a bit, uh, uh, I, I not, didn't feel too good about it. When Cesar won the project, Cesar Vesavil, he won with something that obviously is not an arch. Uh, the good thing is that he fixes a little bit of the pedestrian realm. But uh, uh, they put me uh, uh, near his project saying that I criticized this project, the, the celebrations. And I immediately called him up to say, well, uh, if, uh, I'm sorry if you understand that I'm criticizing that you won. I'm criticizing the competition in general. But, uh, but anyway, uh, they immediate, uh, I don't know if you say mediatized, but they cut the, all the text in the boards when they did this public exhibition. So they only presented uh, our project like this, and they called it a post-nuclear graffiti frog. <laughs> <laughs> so they thought, obviously, we were, we were crazy, you know? And uh, uh, I want to 
I want to talk also about the, the, the contagious strategy because I think now, as architects, obviously, um, we're shifting in our job. Uh, well, I've always seen it a little bit this way, not only now because we have this, this, this crisis, but uh, uh, I've seen that, it, or at least in my personal experience in Mexico, when you're designing, uh, there's really like a, a, a string where you're hanging on with the client. Oh, you're like, oh, and suddenly his brother-in-law comes in and he's an architect, he'll kick you out because now he has yeah, a really close real relative who's an architect, and in Mexico we have architects popping out of the of, uh, everywhere. No, I think we have Mexico is one of the countries that has the most uh, amount of architecture schools. So um, I, I really was struggling to focus. And if you're if you're designing the strategy to be able to design, then uh, you're more uh, uh, reliable to, to to stay on board for a long time because you're planning, you're bringing in. Uh, all the right people to do the work, and this is this is, for instance, one example which that happened, and and um, and then we were called uh, to do the Nestle building, and um, uh, well, uh, a competition to do uh, this type of bridge in the inside of the of the chocolate factory, so kids could witness the production of chocolate without dropping anything uh, on top of the machines. And uh, uh, I remember driving like for for one hour and getting there, I was really depressed. No, I. Uh, it takes almost an hour traffic, it's horrible, you get to Paseo uh, Toyokan and it's a generic factory after the other. And I, ima I was imagining that if I was depressed, imagine a kid that in his head he has Willy Wonka and he wants to get to this fascinating factory of chocolate and he uh, they would uh, even fall asleep even before getting there. So uh, when we presented the project, uh, we made some research and we said, okay, there's I don't know how many cars passing by. They can have this new identity, and I, I tried to convince Nestle and put the example of, uh, of uh, Humex, which in Mexico we have this company that did a crossover, and they have an amazing contemporary art gallery that's really well known. But on what, why don't we do a chocolate museum? Because, I mean, chocolate was invented by the Aztecs, no? And uh, then taken away by the Spaniards and then brought back a hundred years later, as we know it today. So Mexico should have a chocolate museum, and you as Nestle should have this museum, and of course you'll be branding your company, but you're giving something in return to the city. Um, this guy, the vice president at that time, Pierluigi, uh, he went to Switzerland, he got everybody hyped up at the Switzerland headquarters, he called me up and he said that we were going to do the project, uh, at least one part of the project, but we had two months and a half to do the project. Uh, obviously, uh, we, everybody started panicking, because I said, well, I mean, we can draw it really fast, we can get some other friends to help us out. I said, no, I mean, two months and a half to, to design and build it, no? Uh, which was even crazier, no? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I brag that we even beat the Chinese on this one, no? Because we did it in, in, in two months and a half. And most of draw, these drawings were done after the building was built. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was like having a one-to-one -one scale model. The only bathroom was small. <laughs> Yeah, the big scale. Even worse because there were there were three eight-hour shifts. So if you were talking to a, a steel worker and you explain really well the different models and different uh, de sketch details, uh, then he would leave after eight hours, and then another one would come in. You would have to go over the same thing with the new guy, and then eight hours later with the other guy. So this was this was a really exhausting experience, which uh, doesn't happen in many parts of the world. But um, uh, we wanted some other friends that are really cool about the way they work. They said, "Don't do it. I mean, you're gonna." You're going to die in that, uh, the construction site. You're going to be sued because I mean nothing's going to be resolved in a, uh, in a good way in two months and a half. But uh, I mean, we put together a good team, and we said, "Come on, guys! I mean, if, if they're asking for something, and and we think we might, I mean, of course there was a trade-off. No? This is the important part. We sat down with the client, and we said, "Okay, two months and a half. Uh, obviously, I, I mean, we um, uh, we we did a bidding for a couple of companies that, that uh, won the competition to build it, but." Uh, we sat down and we said, you can't, uh, to the client, you can't change anything. We'll do it in two months and a half, but if you don't like the color, the light fixtures, that you can't complain. And uh, so we said, okay, I'll keep my mouth shut and finish the building. So uh, here, for instance, you're seeing the foundation, the concrete, we were doing the steel beams already, cutting, uh, cutting them on, on site. Um, if we would have had more time, of course, you would have nice details of steel uh, plates and the structure a little bit lower, but then, I mean, because of the time frame, we we're just doing things as we, uh, designed the plan to do it in, uh, with the construction company and uh, everything that could go wrong went wrong I always <laughs> it's like Murphy's law no? I mean, it was not rainy season and it rained and um, a lot of things happened which I won't go into the details also but uh, these were some of the last days that we were excited about you see the, the workers are like 
they couldn't believe they were going to finish the project. And this is the thing of the opening where you have uh, Enrique Peña Nieto, and Enrique Peña Nieto, is, I think he's going to be our next uh, president. And, uh, and he's the reason why we had to do it in two months and a half. Uh, he convinced uh, Pierluigi, which is this guy smiling with a, he's biting his teeth because he didn't want to smile, but he was smiling. Uh, he convinced him that if he let him do his political speech in Neste in two months and a half where he needed to present his political speech, he won't, won't make Neste go through all the permits to build this. <laughs> so uh, that was why we needed to do it in two months and a half. And these are the things, again, that you learn as an architect uh, in the process, no? So again, sometimes you don't want to ask too many questions of where the money is coming from, what, what is the purpose of the building, but anyway. Um, this is my daughter, and this is one of the first experiences that I, as an erotic parent, went with my daughter and went over all the details and tried to explain to her, maybe get an architectural answer out of her. And I went, you know, uh, uh, look at the light fixtures, look at the color, look at the, you know, the, the sequence of the path going through the chocolate factory. And uh, obviously when we came out and I asked her what she had liked best, uh, she had stolen this jug, uh, plastic <laughs> jug, and stuffed it with chocolates from the chocolate store, you know? She says, of course that, the chocolate store is the thing that I like best, no? And uh, these are the final images of the, uh, of the building as it sits today. This is the entrance. The only difference, which of course I took away, here they have like a big bunny saying welcome, no? which I, <laughs> I, I tried to convince them to try to do a Jeff Koons version of a chrome, uh, but they didn't like it and it cost a little bit, uh, it was too expensive, so uh, for the images we took the bunny out, but uh, this is what I was expecting. <laughs> I was expecting the, the, the truck coming in, the kids just seeing this big opening, uh, this sequence pulling you towards the inside, and not even, not only for the kids, but I was expecting even grown-ups, I mean, uh, to get into a, a space or something that reminds us that sometimes, I, I, I do sometimes think we get a little bit boring when we're growing up, no? We forget about the, the most important things, and even having playful sequences of space driving you inside, and, and people call it an alebrije, which is like a Mexican pre-Hispanic toy eh, or a chocolate wrap or something. But uh, I mean, we were to create something that really eh, talked about the motion and things happening inside. Obviously, this part is like a dissection of the complete space because it would eventually grow towards a, a motorway, which eh, now eh, I don't think it's going to grow because eh, Pierluigi got picked up by a headhunter and he's now in Unilever, which is the company, the, eh, I think it's a competition of Neste. So, all the people that were related to this vice president now are no longer working for Neste, so I only got to do two buildings with Neste, which I'm, uh, at least I'm happy that we repeated, uh, or we worked again with them. And, uh, I'll go get over really quick the story of this, this other building, and um, uh, when they called us to do the new, ver the new building for Neste, they were, he was really excited that we do another origami version, he said, well, if we can do another red one, but we can choose where to put it. I said, of, of course we're not going to do an, another origami, we're not going to do it red. I mean, what, what's, what's the program now? He said, well, uh, you know, L'Oreal is teaming up with Nestle, they're doing digestible cosmetics, so now you're going to eat a facial cream cookie, or you're going to have a chocolate that uh, tags you, no? So I said, well, let me think about it. I don't think it has to be red. I think I, so we tried to figure out something that was more appealing to the program that was on the inside. And the other part was that, because it sits in Querétaro, where in Querétaro you have a, a UNESCO heritage, the city center, the municipality asked us that it needed to have arches, no? And at some other point in, in, in the office, uh, we would have, of course, denied the job. We would have told the client to, that we had some really nice friends that love arches and, and uh, they would love to do them in this uh, stone. But uh, I think we're at a point now where we like to see what things we didn't like, bring them in and try to rethink them because I think it's a bad decision just to avoid the things that you didn't like. So now we have this perversion, uh, uh, perverse thinking of grabbing things that we didn't like and try to analyze why. So we they grab the arches, we try to do a reinterpretation of the arches. This is the original building, which I, I, I really feel bad we couldn't get to do because I, I really like this version. But uh, what we were trying to do is um, first uh, do this reinterpretation of the arches or the portico. Uh, this, this complete element uh, here, uh, this, is, this, is, this was a complete garage. I um, mean, the parking area. So we try to put the, the parking on the long uh, element uh, of the building and open up uh, the, the bottom part as a public space, gardens, people would walk around the building, and then put the rest of the program here in the tower. Um, obviously, um, the first thing that, I, that got cut out was the parking. The client said, no, we don't have money to put the parking inside a, a nice building. I mean, we're not going to waste that money. So again, we're left with a factory that still has the cars facing the, the, the pedestrian rail. 
uh, which to me, which I hate, no? But uh, anyway, we started thinking of something metallic, like a monolith, like something that's uh, top secret, because even the relationship between Nestle and L'Oreal is kind of spooky, you know, this idea that, that the green, what was the name of the movie? Cuando destino nos alcance? I don't remember, the, the green cookies, no? The, the Sold in green, no? That was, I think that was it. Yeah, sold in green. So, um, but anyway, so the project got downsized about eight times, and we ended up having um, a, a smaller version of the project. And, um, and this is how uh, uh, the project uh, ended up. Uh, we obviously, the, the first thing that we uh, took out is the public space underneath because they wanted to jam the project on the inside. So we uh, put a lab, uh, some labs underneath, we have office space, we have an auditorium. It's a relatively small building, but again, I, I like the idea that Nestle was, was uh, uh, liking or understanding this strategy of giving them something that they would brand the company with. Obviously, they got a lot of press out of the first chocolate museum that we had done, so they wanted to continue with this idea of, of, of um, uh, having interest in buildings. And, and again, with this project, uh, when I talked about digital design and local fabrication, we even, um, understanding that we're working in Mexico, we, we think of ways to present drawings to the guy who's working, because uh, I, 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 will take, I, I will make a movie out of this, but it's really funny when you go to the site and you have the, uh, the bidding and the company that won the contract, you have your drawings, you give it to them so that the owner of the company is really secure about the drawings. So, yeah, we'll, we'll do it in time. And he gives it to the guy next to him, and, and then the guy next to him sees it, and he had, he's starting to have a face with a doubt, no? And they've started passing it on, so it gets to the, to the workers that are really gonna be on the side, and they don't have a fucking clue what they're gonna do. They're like, what? <laughs> so, I mean, uh, we start understanding that we need to do drawings for the workers uh, that you know would normally not do do models for the workers, so they would understand the process of, of, of doing the building. Because again, we, we didn't know how to do this in Mexico for the budget that we that we had. So we created a system of doing wee bars um, with the diameters and then uh, with the heights, and then we figured out it was better to do all the the spheres and then cut the intersections. And the only part that I was uh, 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 convincing my client to, to really spend a little bit of money was the CNC of the intersections in the metal, uh, the metal plates that would uh, intersect the, the bubbles. Um, um, obviously, the contractor uh, wanted to, to do it his own way. The, the original uh, specifications were um, uh, that we, you apply the wee bars and you had a metal mesh and then you splattered concrete until you were polishing it and you got it to a resin finish. And, um, and as you see, let me see in this image. Well, th this is the image that we, this is what we had specified. And this is what we had not specified. The contractor was saying that, well, we won't do CNC. Look, I can put a wee bar, and of course it'll be really accurate. No, so I was saying it won't be accurate. Come on, I mean, there's some, some things that I, I know that are not gonna end up right. And the other thing is that he thought it was a waste of time, the contractor, to do it in, in concrete, so he hired this company that started spraying foam all over. It got, the, the, the site was a mess. It, was, it, it became very uncomfortable. And fortunately, uh, I took this image, which I sent to the president of the company, and I said, uh, this is not a nice thing to be doing, no, in this time. Uh, this is really toxic. This really is, this is contamination, not contagious, no? I mean, but uh, all the workers were, had their masks on, they couldn't even work. Um, so immediately they started uh, scraping off all this of the structure. They opened up the, jo uh, the intersections and they actually put the steel plates that I wanted to, to have on site. And um, this is the, the, the image of the building as it was uh, finished uh, last year. And uh, I, I also like the difference between, you start understanding the way they like to take fix, uh, pictures. Now this, this is E1 who likes to show everything around, the mess, the cables, people. Um, and then uh, this kind of images, for instance, no? And then uh, Paul is always like photoshopping if there's a, a, a brown spot on the garden and he wants to make it all green. And, uh, but, but it's interesting even to see that, that their pers perspective as, um, as photographers. And um, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna close with, uh, with uh, the idea that uh, I'm gonna show you a project, uh, a high rise that we're doing after, after some um, uh, Competition that we did high rise and we were uh, shortlisted and we never got to do. We became really good friends with Yang Song Ma on the Toronto competition, even though we didn't win. He liked our design and we became good friends. And we've been shortlisted in, in, in a couple of uh, tower projects. But finally, for some strange reason, and I'm 
happy about it. We're back in Mexico City and we're going to do our first high rise. And um, this is where I call it contagious pleasures, no? Because there's obviously some things that you do want to be contagious with. And, uh, and um, these are some of the buildings that we did, the, the Hex Tower, uh, that this led to, uh, to uh, the, the Toronto one where we had the, uh, this image, and then this led to uh, another competition. And I won't go through all of them, but I'll, I'll jump really quick into the R42, uh, R432. This is a site in Paso de la Reforma, and uh, Paso de la Reforma to me is one of the most beautiful streets in Mexico, and it has a long history, which I won't also won't go through it, but uh, uh, it changed the zoning. This is, this is uh, a building done by Cesar Pelli, St. Regis. It, this one blew the, the it, it has a record of sales in Reforma. They sold about $8,000 a square meter for an apartment, but, uh, and um, this is El Angel de la Independencia, uh, and this is La Diana where, where our site sits. And uh, they changed the zoning from 20 levels. This is how you would see it, and it's going to change dramatically. You'll see in a couple of years, uh, because I, I think if, if, if some of you know Mexico, uh, Santa Fe, where they took uh, the Ibero and they try to do the new financial center, is really not working as it should because it didn't have the infrastructure to get there. So most people are coming down from Santa Fe and they want to settle in Reforma because again, it's, it's in the center, you have all the infrastructure, you have everything, you don't have to move uh, by car and be stuck in traffic all the time. So they changed the zoning from 20 levels to 40 levels and this is where we sit. Uh, my client thought he won the jackpot because uh, he had only three lots when, uh, when it was a 20 level zoning and then when they changed it, he didn't tell the neighbors and he started buying them. Uh, the last ones obviously knew about the zoning so he paid more money, but anyway. This is our a billboard on the site as, uh, as it sits today where my friends call me up and say, you have to have a party, you, you have a billboard there already. And uh, after everything that's happened, uh, uh, at least in my own personal experience, I say, you know what, one day at a time. <laughs> let's, let's wait to see what happens tomorrow because I mean, not because you have a billboard, it means it, it will get built, no? So uh, I'm trying to save my enthusiasm for the I, I show a little bit now and then, but uh, I'll wait. These are some of the views. Uh, and, um, and what we were trying to do with the building, and, and again, I mean, the client wanted us to enhance the views of the building. And um, if we wanted to, we were saying, if we have the units popping out, instead of having a flat facade, what's the best excuse to have better views? So we were thinking of bay windows, which obviously we, I hate bay windows, but I, I know it's a practical element because it potentializes the area, the, the views that you want to have. So we said, why don't we do a reinterpretation of bay windows? What happens if we do it in a, in a different way? The idea, obviously, Want, I'll show you some of the, uh, the facade the images, but it's like these fragments that you have different reflections from the city. And program-wise, also uh, uh, doing a lot of research in Reforma, uh, you have all the riots happening, so we only created the drop-off here, and we created the access in the back, so in case you had riots, you had uh, all the stuff that happens uh, regularly in Mexico, uh, you would not be faced with a, a problem getting inside your unit. You have, uh, Res uh, retail at the bottom, three levels of retail, you have residential, and then you have um, a, a hotel on top. The client got uh, the Buddha bar from Paris, the hotel, uh, to come to Mexico and be part of the, of, of the, of the complete project, which I think is a good idea because, it, it, I mean, they're not only getting it as the hotel operators, but they got into the core business, so they're going to take care also of the people buying the units as a service. Uh, another important thing, most of the things that happen in Mexico is that sometimes uh, the high rises that you have, first of all, they're really, uh, there's like a non-negotiation with the pedestrian, you know? it's like they don't, wanna, they don't want people walking around their building, it's like they, they it's, it's terrible, I think it's a really bad uh, thing, or sometimes they even have their own materials popping out and they want to invade their sidewalks with their new uh, marble or granite or depending on the materials. So in this case, we're bringing in the original pavement of Reforma, uh, putting it inside our building. This used to be a closed street, and we bought the last, well, my client bought the last piece of property, and I convinced him not to build on that side and open up the street towards the back. So the municipality uh, liked the idea. Uh, they, let us, they gave us a bit more, uh, uh, a higher, I mean, we're doing 52 levels instead of the 40 permitted because uh, we could densify more the project. Uh, they thought it was a great idea because now we're potentializing or we're making the, the, the part in the back of the project in Tokyo Street have direct access towards Reforma. And another thing that we wanted to create on the building is break it up into nine elements or nine pieces. 
Um, it, it, it's nine modules, and each module gets a, a different theme, gets a different uh, graphic design, uh, chromatics. Um, this is a little bit of how you go in the drop-off, you enter the residential units. If you want to go to the hotel, you enter this part. Uh, go up one level, and then you have some panoramic elevators in the back. Uh, this is the street, how it opens towards uh, Tokyo Street in the back. And uh, again, three levels of the, of the retail. The residential part is something that is also very difficult to do, is that originally we had the elevators here for the hotel. And uh, we changed them to the other, uh, to that part because uh, they needed, instead of two elevators, they needed three elevators for uh, the 56 rooms that they're having. So my client immediately said, well, this is sellable space, so why don't we make this unit bigger? Uh, so you know what, this is what all the developers want to do, they want to sell everything. So I think if you close down this space, you're losing a lot of the, the, the interesting the features because when you come out of the elevators and you look out through this window, you get the best view of Chapultepec and, and the, the castle of Chapultepec. And it's a nice public space as a garden. Um, and he agreed that the, uh, well, he agreed and also uh, the government was, uh, the, the municipality wanted us to have green, green features on the building, so uh, we got it. Uh, I, well, I got it as we wanted, <laughs> and uh, the public realm, and then this this garden part. So these are the modules. This is a little bit of how the building is, is, is starting to look. We're working. It's it's funny because also in Mexico, our clients don't have uh, the idea of consultants is not very common, and uh, bringing in a consultant is a bit complicated because they think that you're supposed to design everything as the architect. And uh, we brought in the guys from Front, the guys from New York, Front Inc., which we're having an incredible time uh, working uh, with them as facade consultants. Um, these are some of the features. Obviously, uh, there's a certain amount of modules, so it's not complicated to, to build the facade. And, um, and I mean, some uh, sustainable issues which we're concerned, but obviously we're not concerned because we want to certify it or anything. We want to do it because we feel it's the right thing. These are, this is a site as it's been demolished. We already demolished the 12th site, the 12th uh, plots and we're uh, breaking ground in May uh, for the building. This is how it will look in, in Paso de la Reforma. This is on a Sunday when they close down the street and they have the bicycles. Um, uh, they close it down for pedestrian and for bicycle using. I see people with, uh, walking by with their dogs and everything, which is really great. Drop off some ideas of how the building comes down and touches the ground with a stainless steel structure when it's exposed uh, on the lower level. And uh, a metal perforated skin towards the Manchester Street so you can have an urban, a, a better urban response, the entrance to the uh, commercial areas. This is an image that I love because, again, it's a bit like today when you had this beautiful view of the volcanoes, no? We had the Popocatépetl and the Isla. And uh, uh, because we, we had really strong winds, so it was one of the days that we can just take a picture and, and, and do a rendering where you could see the volcanoes, but we uh, never get to see them. And this is one of the views towards the street. And, well, we're still working on the amenities, how it looks at night, how oh, the compositions, I mean, we're, it's, it's 70 square meter modules, and you can actually configure it any way you want. Uh, we're selling or we're trying to design uh, everything on the interior, uh, on the inside, I mean, turnkey projects, as you call it. Um, this is how it looks from, from below. And an image where you already have, the one in the back is the one, one by Richard Rogers and Legorreta for Bancomer. And this is the arch competition that won <laughs> this, this element over there. And uh, this is what I'm explaining, that it's going to transform, uh, it's going to be crazy when we, when we finish when they finish doing the uh, reforma when it's complete. And the idea, uh, and I want to close off just by saying that uh, uh, what we want to do is provide the best thing possible for the client. We don't want to work in isolation. We don't believe in isolation. I think this is a, a concept that to me no longer makes sense because the more you're exposed, the more you learn about people around you. Uh, I want to break more bones, no? <laughs> uh, and I want to learn uh, a bit more of things to do. Uh, this is something that uh, that is a life uh, thing, no? I, I want to feel that because I, I feel that I'm always risking. And I would just want to close by saying, uh, nevertheless, we know that without contact, and of course, a certain contagious risk, life does not endure. It does not change. It does not reproduce. In one word, it does not live. Thank you.